and welcome back to Football Made Simple. In 2018, England made the semi-final of a World Cup for the first time in 28 years. At current, they are ranked 4th in FIFA's rankings of men's national football teams and are joint second favourites to win Euro 2021, behind France and joint with Belgium. And when looking at the total market values of each nation's squad, England have comfortably the most valuable squad, all of which are good indicators for England. But it wasn't so long ago, in the late 2000s and early 2010s, that the three Lions looked hopeless and destined to fall behind every other major footballing nation. So how has England improved the quality of their players so drastically? Well, let's take a look. And if you want to keep up to date with England and any other nation at the Euros, check out our video sponsor, OneFootball. They are the best app to keep you up to date for breaking news, match updates, formations, stats and anything you could possibly want. The best part is completely free through the link in the description below. And that's not all, you could also potentially win an England shirt with OneFootball's first giveaway on this channel as they aim to see which is the most supported team at the Euros. So, by clicking the link down below and downloading one football, you stand the chance of winning the shirt, regardless of where you are. In the early to mid 2000s, England had an undoubted golden generation, full of world-class players. But unfortunately, due to various factors, they could never put it together as a team. But there is a feeling that this golden generation was more coincidental than a result of a system, as evidenced by a comparative lack of depth. And as they aged out, the quality of the squad and of the performances steadily got worse. At the 2010 World Cup, they were having to field teams like this. And the players of Euro 2012 weren't of much higher quality. Three poor performances at major tournaments were the signal for the FA that change was desperately needed. And there were a few key problems that were identified. The first was that kids in England become competitive too quickly. This involves playing 11 vs 11 from a young age, as well as having competitive tournaments too early. The more players on a pitch, the less touches any individual has, and less time on the ball means less chance to develop technically. So, other nations, such as Spain, promote futsal, as its 5 vs 5 format gives them an advantage. The pressure to win also means that players are less likely to take risks in their game, which stifles their development. It also means that coaches naturally will pick the bigger and quicker athletes rather than the better players, as at a young age this makes the difference. This is known as the relative age effect, where young players born earlier in the year have more success early on due to being more physically developed. But the problem is, the bigger players rely heavily on their athleticism to make the difference rather than developing technically, whilst the slight, technical players are unable to compete at this age and may drop out. So, at senior level, where each player, roughly speaking, is now big and strong, the more athletic players have lost their edge and have less technique to boot. Secondly, players received less coaching, primarily due to the regulations of the time. So where graduates in other countries would have north of 8,000 coaching hours at graduation, an English academy graduate would just have over 2,500. In addition, becoming a qualified coach in England is significantly more expensive than on the continent. The primary example being that a UEFA A license in England could cost almost £6,000, whereas the same qualification elsewhere would cost €430 Euros in Germany and just over €1,000 in Spain. As a result, England had 2,700 UEFA qualified coaches compared to Spain's 24,000 and Germany's 35,000, meaning that kids in Spain and Germany would be more likely to receive high quality coaching. Fourthly, the old regulations only allowed kids to sign for a club within a 90 minute drive of their home, meaning that players couldn't go to the best academies but just the ones closest to them. The FA also identified that not enough English talents were getting on the pitch, instead being supplanted by superstar imports from across the globe. At the same time, English talents were unwilling to go abroad due to the greater wages promised in England even at an early age. Things were looking bleak and the FA had to react and they took inspiration from how other countries such as Spain, Germany and France had rebuilt their teams after losing their way. The first steps had been identified by former FA technical director Howard Wilkinson, who noted how France, a consistent producer of top talent, had a symbolic heart of football in the Clairefontaine training centre. Wilkinson also wanted a national football centre 
which would provide the equivalent of an Oxford and Harvard level of footballing education. And in 2013, St. George's Park was opened, filled with world-class facilities. This was just the start. The biggest difference maker was the introduction of the Elite Player Performance Plan, or EPP. This was essentially their game plan to start producing quality players laid out in four. Its most famous initiative is the homegrown player rule, where for a side to use its maximum squad size of 25, 8 players must be homegrown, where homegrown means being on the books of a club for at least 3 years before turning 21. But the EPP was so much more than that, and placed a special emphasis on revamping the academy system. Inspired by Germany, their first step was introducing a category system for the academies that would divide academies into four buckets based on quality, determined by factors such as productivity rate, training facilities, coaching, education, and the quality of facility. Clubs would then be motivated to improve their academy facilities due to the advantages being Category 1 gave them. These included greater funding from the FA, Category 1 clubs are also able to scout players from any club in the country, and if they identify a player they like, they can sign them for a relatively low fee. This is because they also introduce more fixed transfer fees between different category clubs to prevent lower category clubs pricing players out of moves to better academies. This is backed up by the fact that many category 1 clubs no longer have the 90 minute drive catchment area rule when signing players, and can instead sign players from anywhere in the country. This basically means that Category 1 clubs act as mini performance centers dotted around the country and drawing all the best young talents so that they can train against each other. Furthermore, Category 1 clubs are now allowed more coaching hours with younger players of up to 8,500 hours as they work closely with schools to ensure that education goals are still met. This is in contrast to say Category 4 clubs who can only sign players 17 and older once they have been released from other clubs. To combat the relative age effect, the Premier League also launched a bio-banding program. So, players are grouped according to their biological age instead of their chronological age. This means that players will play against those of similar size, meaning that no one becomes overly reliant on size and thus have to develop technically. The goal of all of this is to produce players who suit the New England DNA. Whereas before, players came from different backgrounds with no cohesive style, they look to change this. From under 15 to senior level, every team must play the England way. This means when in possession, knowing when to counter-attack, retain the ball, progress and penetrate, and maintain security, and when to create and score. Out of possession, they should all be comfortable pressing, delaying, jockeying, and utilizing emergency defending. And crucially, unlike most teams with their DNA, England would not be married to a single formation, instead having a style of play take precedence. So, what have the results of the EPPP been? It has undoubtedly been a success. Although many have credited the homegrown quota as being a major influence, it is interesting to note that the percentage of English players in the league is still relatively similar in the last 15 years. The difference is, these 38% are now of a much higher quality. Many of them are more technical and adaptable and ready to exert their influence on the game. This is shown with teams in other leagues now raiding English academies with the promise of more game time. And key to this, English youngsters are more now willing to take the risk to move abroad, particularly to Germany, as they know giving up money now for more game time is the better long-term solution. The best examples of this are the likes of Sancho, Bellingham, Lookman, Smithrow, and more. The results have also showed at youth international tournaments. They won the Under-20 World Cup, the Euro Under-19s, and reached the final with the Under-17s and the semi-finals with the Under-21s. Many of these players are now regular contributors at club level, such as Foden, Greenwood, Saka, and more. This means England now have a high quality first 11 with good strength and depth in most areas. But the one area they need to address to maximize the potential of their team is coaching. The restrictive costs of coaching means that there is a smaller pool to pick from and therefore less quality. A lack of a quality coach is one of the factors that held back the golden generation and England will be hoping not to repeat that trick. But what else do you think contributed to England's increase in quality? Drop it down below. A quick shout out to my Patreons for helping to make this video possible. 
If you want to support, head on over to patreon.com slash simple and you'll get rewards like early access to videos and exclusive content. But that's all for today and remember, keep it simple. Mm-hmm.